And Soke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kyle and everybody. Thanks for having me on. Um, look, this the idea of this was obviously a talk rather than a physical go through of techniques and everything else. And um, I wanted to be quite casual in the sense that it's a conversation. And I always like to say that a lot of what I say is really my opinion um, on things, the way I look at things, what keeps me motivated. You know, Kyle and I were talking about what to talk about and I think it's a particularly trying time at the moment with COVID and people are finding it very hard to get the motivation in whatever area they have a passion in. And in this case, it's our martial arts. And, um, and I, guess, I guess it's probably best that I just talk about what I do. Uh, and again, I wanna encourage everybody, if you have any questions, you know, there's this, I have a saying, there's no such thing as a stupid question. The only silly question is the one you don't ask and uh, happy to sort of at least give you my opinion or something that you, uh, you're inquiring about. So the, um, I think, you know, I, I get a little, not embarrassed, not the word, I, I'm very careful. I've done a lot of podcasts where people immediately ask me, especially if I'm overseas, oh, how are you handling lockdown? You know, how terrible is it and blah, blah, blah. And I like to preface by saying, please understand, I have total, total understanding of gym owners, business owners, restaurant owners, et cetera, et cetera, and people that no longer have their normal, you know, access to business and income and everything else. And, and obviously that's a given. But I, then if the question is asking me directly, I just, I don't have a particular problem with the lockdown in that I've often said I refuse to put myself in a negative headspace over something that I can't control. Meaning I can curse Daniel Andrews, our premier and everybody, the rules and everything else, but I can only imagine that all of that is for the best of the community as a whole. And I'm the one that loses more if I go around just with an angry mindset again about things that I can't control. So I figure my job and Circo Bob, we've talked about this a lot, you know, if they want you to wear a mask, just wear a mask. You know, it's not that big a deal. People talk about, oh, it's hard to breathe and everything else. God, I had asthma attacks when I was a kid. You know, if anyone's going to have trouble breathing with a mask, it'd be me. And Judy and I just went for an hour and a half walk this morning and it's fine. Is it better without? Of course it is, you know, but we've, we've just got to, we've, you know, martial arts is, is about hardship. You know, I always used to say that the dojo is a miniature, miniature philosophy of life in that you enter this space and there's winning and there's losing, there's pain, there's hardships, there's, there's confusion. All of those aspects come out in the, in the course of a martial arts journey, which is really what our life is outside, you know, whether it work and the boss gives you a difficult task, and sometimes we think, I have no idea how to do this. You can either run away from it or you can go, you know what? I'm just going to give it 100% of what I'm capable of and, uh, and hope for a good outcome. And I think martial arts is about that. It's about perseverance and it is about the battles. You know, look at our three battles form or Sun Chin. It's literally called three battles unifying mind, body and spirit. In other words, there's hardship in everything we do in martial arts and dealing with COVID to me is. It's another hardship. One way I could deal with it is to just lie up in a little fetal position and, and complain about everything around me, or I just get on with it, which is what I tend to do. And I find with my, my lockdown that I've probably done more reading and more going back on notes that I had in the 60s and 70s. I used to make a lot of notes than ever before because I'm looking up YouTube clips of old masters. In other words, I'm, I've given myself time to do something that I would normally not allow time for. And this is important because there's a there's an interesting um, word and I know we're not supposed to be all talking things Japanese, but there's a there's a saying called shuhari, shuhari with a hyphen in between you know, it basically is about a system of learning or a way of learning in that the shoe, and I won't go into too much detail about it, but the shoe is where 
the SHU part is where you're a student, you go in and you're under a sensei and you basically do everything exactly as you're told. The stances, the punches, the forms or the kata are exactly as you are taught. And this is important and it's a very, very difficult stage to get through. You know, it's a, it's a difficult stage of learning, of understanding, of comprehension, everything else. And moving on, we go into the ha stage, which is where you understand the fundamentals, you understand the punches and the blocks and the shape of and everything else. And you start to put your own individual feel or meaning into those moves. In other words, I've always said martial arts is about individual expression. And th that's important. Art, art is individual expression and martial art is about individual expression to some point in that I could be an instructor and teach you how to do a basic upper block, middle block, lower block, certain deep stances, et cetera, et cetera. And you do them exactly as I show you, but I bet you that each individual will have a slightly different feel when they perform those particular moves. In other words, there's no way you'll do it exactly like I do, even though you were trying to copy the shape that I would give you as an instructor. And that's kind of where you get to the hard stage where you're starting to, to express your martial arts in your own way. Um, even if you're in a class with 20 other people and everybody is doing three battles, I still would say that every individual would have a slightly different expression of that form, even though to the untrained eye, it looks like everybody is doing exactly the same thing. And that's an incredibly important thing to understand and realize. Again, if I often say that if I had five painters and I told them to paint a tree, the same tree with five different painters, I bet you would look different on each of those five canvases. And that's about art. That's about individual expression, which gets us to the final restage of Shuhari, where you transcend the fundamentals as they were taught to you, you've understood the meaning and the expression when you do them in that shape. And the restage, which only comes after, one would suppose at minimum of 20 years training is when you can start to develop your own kind of system or way of doing similar blocks or techniques. It becomes very individual. And I'll, I'll give you a reason why I'm going through this, that I, I use the analogy, you've probably heard me before about music. You know, if I'm learning piano, I will learn exactly the same notes, exactly the same chords as any other beginning when they're start, starting to learn music. Eventually, I will hopefully be able to read music and I'll be able to play a song that somebody else has, has uh, put together, you know, has written. The ultimate expression of all those fundamental notes and chords is when I compose my own music, that becomes my individual expression of those fundamentals. And martial arts is like that. And the reason I, I kind of uh, bring that up is that I often say to people when I teach that if I'm teaching you something, don't wait for the next time you see me to be the next time you even think about this particular technique. Let's say it, it is three battles or Sun Chin. In other words, the, there's a whole, whole value in taking what I show you and what I tell you to do as an instructor and then getting by yourself. In other words, you're not in a class where you are by design by the instructor, you have to do everything the way I would want you to do it, particular order, particular cadence, particular speed. The interesting part when you're by yourself is that heart stage where you get to take that shape and you get to play with. In other words, you become an individual expressing that particular art form in your own unique way. And I've got to tell you that no matter what you do, none of that can be wrong. Even if you make mistakes, that's not wrong because the only way you learn is by making mistakes. In other words, it's your chance for introspection to just play and have fun with, with what it is you're doing. And again, I'm bringing this up because of say lockdown is a bit of a, you know, kind yeah. of thing that I get to, I get to be in my lounge room. I get to watch different tapes. I get to read books. I read kinesiology. I read a lot of theory on movement and immediately 
I'll read a line or something that makes me go, oh, wow, how interesting is that? And I immediately go, well, how can I apply that principle to say, you know, lulled before the storm or whatever? How, how can I change my expression of that particular kata or form with a new knowledge I've just obtained? In other words, being by yourself and reading and accessing knowledge, especially with the technology we have with, you know, with YouTube and everything else, you have a chance to become your own instructor, you know? And that doesn't mean that when you get to class, by the way, that you can suddenly go off on a tangent and be your own person on the map. There's a time that we have to go by the rules of the system or the tradition of the particular style. And we all express the ABCs of that style exactly the same way on the mat. But again, don't ever think that you can't get by yourself in your own space and express your art the way you feel. And maybe some of it's wrong, maybe some of it's right, but again, it becomes your individual expression. I would say that very little of that can be wrong in the fact that you are still going to learn so much from it. Also, it gives you a chance, I think, to discover, I would say drilling is about finding out what you don't know about something as much as what you do. And having that personal introspection is a chance for you to actually run into roadblocks where you don't understand something. And this is again, hopefully where your instructor comes in, where you arrive at a problem or something that needs to be solved that you can't find your own answer to. And you go to your instructor and you try and find an answer based on hopefully the years, uh, more knowledge that that particular sensei or instructor has. And I just think that that makes a fantastic and interesting journey for you guys. You know, I, I know, you know, guys know when I went to the US in 79, um, you know, it wasn't just about making movies. When I went to the US, I went as Linda Ronster and James Taylor's personal bodyguard. I got asked to work full time for Linda, for the younger ones. Linda was as big as Beyonce in her day in rock and roll and country and West and everything else. And um, I went over and of course, as you know, I first person I called through meeting Chuck Norris in 1978 through Bob going to America, meeting Chuck and bringing him out. Chuck and I got on, you know, like a house on fire. And he said to me, if you ever get to California, look me up and we'll do some training. And of course, when I went to the US, the first person I called was Chuck immediately started training at his house every day. And through Chuck, I got to meet Benny the Jet Okidas, Tadashi Yamashita, Fumio Demura, Bill Wallace, um, Pete Sugarfoot Cunningham. These are names some of you won't know. It doesn't matter. They're all absolute legends in their own right. And suddenly I'm no longer in a, a Zendokai mindset as such. I am now into a martial arts mindset. And having the ability to go to Fumio Demura, who did a different style to us, a traditional martial artist, an amazing instructor, to go and train with um, Demura Sensei was just amazing. He would stay back on Saturdays, help me with weapon forms and everything else. I would drive to Benny Okidas, is this before he had the Jet Center, and he started me in kickboxing. I got hooked up with um, Pete Sugarfoot Cunningham who has seven world titles in kickboxing, had an undefeated record. Tadashi Yamashita, I met on the set of The Octagon, who was basically a Shuren Ryu stylist, but had his own individual expression of the art. So suddenly I'm in a whole melting pot of knowledge, very unlike what I had been doing in Australia. And I, I was just like, I was like a little kid in a playground. You know, it was the most amazing experience to be able to learn from different masters, different knowledge. And by the way, there's not a lot of difference with all of it. We all have two arms and two legs. It's a matter of how we express our arts, you know, given the style and everything. But there's a lot of principles that remain very constant, no matter what style you do. But the point being that what I experienced over there just developed me as a martial artist, like nothing I had been through before. But you can also do that. You know, what I say to a lot of people is when I started karate and when Soko Bob, we didn't even have video machines, you know, the old big cassettes, let alone DVDs or anything else. We didn't have internet. And I used to say we only learnt what our instructor would teach us in the order he wanted to teach us and when he wanted to teach us. You had no say and you had to physically be at a class or there is no way to get that knowledge 
except for maybe the occasional book and anyone that's tried to learn actual physical techniques out of a book, it's not that easy. The difference today is you have no excuse. You know, I was teaching a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu class the other night, graded some people in Benigo and I said, you know what? You know, how badly do you want this? I said, you actually don't even need me. You have no excuse for not advancing your knowledge. You know, you become your own instructor because at the click of a mouse, you can access every master of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that exists today, whether it's leg locks or arm bars or whatever it is, you can access that. So it really gets down to you and how badly do you want it? And, you know, there's a saying that everybody can, but not everybody does. You know, there's a lot of watching and looking. There's a, I, I, there's a difference between knowledge and knowing, as I like to say, knowledge is yes, I watch it and I see it on YouTube and I have a look at it and I become an armchair expert. The knowing is the actual doing, you know, it's you doing and internalizing that knowledge and making it your own. Sensei Benny always has a saying that I love to repeat. When somebody tries to teach him something, he says, oh, wait a minute, he says, before you start showing me this technique, what personal life experience do you have with what you're teaching me? In other words, did you just see it on YouTube yesterday or in a book, or have you actually spent time really finding the ins and outs, the negatives and the positives of the technique you're showing me? Have you pressure tested it? And that gets down to the doing. And this again gets back to what I'm saying about being stuck at home. Yes, you can't lift weights. It's nice to have equipment and everything, but the great thing with martial arts and what we do with your kata and everything else and your forms is you don't need anybody. It's the battle with yourself. It's the battle for self-improvement. And that's something that a lot of people will talk about. But as I said, and it was a, a, one of the, um, it was a singer on The Voice that was a cancer survivor. She's still not completely over it, but it was such a fascinating talk that she gave about the doing, you know, everybody can, but not everybody does. In other words, she just wants, she never wants to know what it's like to not actually try to overcome her particular affliction. Well, what if I am over to get, able to overcome for her this cancer? You know, what would that feel like? And it's very easy for us to, again, crawl up in a little fetal position and kind of just give it in and rationalize all the reasons why you can't be a doer. Well, my back hurts. Well, I don't have a gym. Well, I don't have people to train with. You know, they're just cop outs, you know. Benny, again, and I've said this a lot before, he always, we had a lot of conversations. And again, sorry, for those younger ones, Benny the Jet Okidas is a kickboxing legend, another gentleman that I trained with for 30 plus years, un unbeaten kickboxing record. But he would always say that he said, I will never utter the words, I'm getting older, I've got to slow down. Well, my knees aren't good because he believes once you do that, you give yourself a psychological crutch to not have to participate fully anymore. And I get that, you know, I was talking to Carl. I mean, I go and lift weights just about every second day and I lift pretty heavy. It's a weight training routine I've done since I was a teenager. So it's 60 plus years. And I'm telling you, there is nothing more boring or harder than just throwing inanimate objects around the room, like doing curls or barbells or squats or anything. But it becomes part of my development, my discipline that I do this. I know the benefits. The easy thing would be to say, well, it's too hard. Well, I'm a bit old. I don't need to do that anymore. But I'm not prepared to know what that mindset feels like. So I'm always going to try and tax myself. And I'm just encouraging everybody within our style to just be a doer. And I tell you the other thing too, and I'm, I'm sort of jumping all over the place here, but it's stuff that's going in my head that um, Rodney King is a South African friend, you know, has uh, crazy monkey boxing and that. He's, he's a very interesting guy and a philosopher. And I, I printed out a little thing that he posted the other day and he said, which really struck a chord with me. He said, I'm learning more and more to engage with experiences purely for the joy of it, rather than worrying about the outcome. I stop calling what I do to keep fit a workout or training, and rather to focus on simply playing with movements. 
My boxing trainer is no longer a fight, but rather a game of tag. When I do jiu-jitsu, it's time to play flow. He says, we need to stop measuring everything. We need to stop wanting everything to end in victory. We need to stop punishing ourselves for not meeting the expectations of modernity. Um, step out of the status quo and this week do a bunch of things that no, have no real measurable value, but instead bring you joy. And I think there's a huge amount in that because if you look at me, if I'm using myself as an example, and uh, Carl knows this, I've recently started doing private sessions with Lucky Giles. Lucky Giles is probably the, one of the best half a dozen crapless in the world at the moment, specializes in leg locks, heel hooks, which as Kyle knows for older school jujitsu players, it's very, very foreign. It's probably the last five years that leg locks have come into vogue in the competition circuit, not so much in combatives. And it's, you know, it's, it's something that when we did jujitsu, if you attack the legs, it was almost like kicking a person in a street fight when they're lying on the ground. It was just dirty pool. That's all changed. And I've got together with Lockie and, and I talk about do your head and I feel like it's a whole new art. And I sort of, people ask, why are you doing it? I'm 71 years old. There's no way I'm going to compete anymore. I'm not doing it to win a title. I'm not winning it for any other reason that I just find it fascinating to challenge myself in a whole new area of the martial arts arts world. And it's just exhilarating, which gets back to what I was saying about um, Rodney King, about doing stuff purely for joy. I, I'm not even great for rolling anymore with anybody, you know, and my shoulders are jacked up and all of that, but I just still get such a pleasure in challenging myself, taking myself out of my comfort zone and just trying to learn something new. And I try and do that almost on a daily basis. Of course, that's not possible, but I try and do it. I'll keep reading, I'll keep reading science magazines. I want something that will help me express my art in a slightly different way. As I've said a lot, I do not wanna be the same martial artist today that I was five years ago. Even though three battles we're using example might look the same, I'm trying to find a different way to express it. So it becomes individual, it becomes my expression of my art. And that brings me joy. And I know a lot of people when we go to seminars, you know, we have our training days. What I find is that if you have a seminar and I've conducted them that is unrelated to the actual grading coming up, that you get two people. And what the classes are full with is when it addresses exactly what those students need to attain their next rank. Which if you think about what I said with Rodney is kind of the opposite of, of measurement. You know, well, I'm going to get this if I do that, as opposed to, gee, let's just be in the moment today. Let's just jump in to an area that we have very little knowledge on and just see what this is all about and feel it and express it. And very possibly it's something that's going to totally enhance what you need for your gradings anyway. And um, I guess that's all I'm saying that I'm trying to, to, to I just want everybody to challenge themselves. Um, just get out of mediocrity. You've heard me say over and over, I, I hate the English word mediocrity. Society for, is full of mediocre people oh i'm good enough oh i'm getting by i'm okay you know fuck that you know you want to set yourself this way you want to keep going toward that excellence and i always say excellence is unattainable but the journey towards it is not and that continual striving for knowledge and improvement plasticity of the brain that comes from a complex set of physical movements like jujitsu how invaluable is that for your mind, body, and everything if you develop as a human being? Because eventually you will get rewards. You know, I get rewards at my age by being able to do stuff that some 40 year olds can't do. It's not by accident. That's not bragging at all. That's just saying that if you do the work and if you immerse yourself in continual improvement, both physically and mentally, you don't have to be the stereotypical 50, 60 year old or 70 year old that walks around like they're already in the grave, you know? So it takes work and it takes commitment. You know, with some of the podcasts we've done, some of the boys have got into Wim Hof. Well, guess what? Wim Hof doesn't take anybody else. You don't need an instructor. 
You don't need anyone sitting beside you. There's, there's, if you go on YouTube, there's little apps that take you, just walk you through the whole breathing system, 30 breaths in, a breath retention, hold for 15 seconds, you do four sets of that, and you've just done something incredible for your body. Follow that with a cold shower. You know, I, I there's some mornings, and again, again, why I bring this up, people look at someone like myself or like a Bob or Carl as instructors, oh, these guys must do everything every day, and they're so disciplined, bullshit. There are days that it sucks, you know, it's the worst thing I can ever think of is to actually do a bit of training. Ironically, as soon as I start that little mental talk, I will end up doing exactly what I was presenting doing and I'll end up enjoying it more than I ever could. Cold shower is an example, you know, I have a cold shower every day. I try and stand for at least two, two and a half minutes. I put my little iPhone timer on. As you can imagine down here, the water's freezing, but what a great disciplinary thing to do. You know, it's a mindset. And as soon as I get in the shower and I have a warm shower first and I start thinking, no, not today. I'm not, I'm just going to get out, have a nice warm shower and enjoy it. And as soon as I start that chatter, I immediately find myself physically reaching for the taps, turning the hot off and turning the cold on. Ironically, when I get through the two and a half minutes, I couldn't be more ecstatic not just through having done it and knowing that it's going to be healthy for me and my respiratory system and my, my immune system, but merely the fact that I was disciplined enough to carry it through. And uh, it's a huge thing. And I'm just encouraging everybody again, challenge up. Wim Hof is a fantastic thing for you to do. Another thing that I like to do in lockdown for me personally is visualization. I started visualization in the seventies. You probably heard that so, okay, Bob and I, when we started Zendaka, we would often invite people in for to give talks. And it could be Hare Krishna, it could be a, a, a vegan specialist, it could be whatever. And we invited this particular gentleman, Tony <laughs> Rafferty. Me. <laughs> Is that me? Shoes, shoes felt nice, though. <laughs> Um, Tony Rafferty gave this talk and he was in his 40s. He held world records with long distance running. He'd run, run from Melbourne to Adelaide, et cetera, et cetera. And I won't go into the whole story, but I remember him saying, he said, look, I know you probably think I'm going to talk about how to get fit and get the endurance in order, in order to be able to win a world record in endurance running. But he said, there's people half my age I'm going to keep competing against. There's got to be more to it. And one of the things he introduced me to was the idea of hypnosis and positive mental imagery where he would, he went to a hypnotherapist and learned how to get into an alpha state of mind, which is a state that hypnotherapists put you into where you bypass that frontal lobe that questions everything and starts to put too much of an analytical spin on things. You're a little more suggestive. Anyway, you go into an alpha state and he would imagine himself before a run, three weeks before he did the run, he would sit down in a chair. You, there's a technique where you look up at 45 degrees, which actually instigates alpha ray, uh, brain waves and put you into that. Again, I'm, it's not a hypnotic state, but it's similar too. And he would see a big hole in the ground and he'd watch himself going and he'd go down this little step ladder into a hole in the ground and he'd set up a movie projector movie project that's how long ago this was you know put it up and he'd turn it on and there was a screen and he'd sit down in his chair and he would watch himself and this is all in his mind's eye he would watch himself watching himself on the screen do this world distance run in record time he'd see dogs yapping at his feet he'd see people at the end congratulating and see newspaper articles Rafferty does it again another world record and why he did that was to allay the fears and the apprehension, the stress of, can I do it? Because anyone who knows about visualization knows that your subconscious can't distinguish between imagination and reality. If you imagine it to be real enough, as far as your nervous system is concerned, it's real for you and you will get real physical, you know, reactions, whether it's, you know, fl blood flow, muscle tension or whatever. Why am I saying this? I'm just giving another example of, of running with stuff that you alone can run with. After I did that, I immediately found a hypnotherapist. I went to a hypnotherapist for months and months to learn 
how to get a key word to get me to a relaxed state. I would use the visualization before I did all the um, major demonstrations that I did the Melbourne Town Hall and around the country in the early 70s. I would visualize everything about that demonstration. You know, the speed I wanted, the power I wanted, the energy I wanted, the audience reaction to it. In other words, I took on Tony's method and I still do it to this, to this day. The point being again, that in COVID, I'm back in the visualization. What an amazing tool that again, takes nobody else but me and my desire to use it to better myself. I tell you students, what a great time for you if you've got a grading coming up. Of course, you'll have to understand perfectly the, the forms, how to do them, the techniques you're going to display in your grading. You have to understand that because you need to visualize a perfect like mental blueprint and go over and over and the trick is to go at quarter speed, half speed, three quarter speed, and eventually you go through it mentally at full speed and then faster. In other words, I can go through three battles in you know, 10 seconds in my mind and it just cements the technique, it cements the feeling I want and everything else. Again, what's the point? It's another sort of area of knowledge. It's, it's out there, it's accessible to everybody that you can do by yourself. The question is again, how badly do you want to be better at what you do and what are you prepared to do to get there? I mean, that's again, I get back to Lucky Giles. I, I keep saying, I, this, what am I gonna do with it? Doesn't matter. It's what we're talking about. It's the simple joy of learning something new that just, that, that's gonna challenge me and, and make me a better martial artist. And it's purely for me. I'm not even ever gonna demonstrate leg locks. It's for a personal, reasons that I'm that I'm doing it and you can all do exactly the same thing um the other thing that's that I I do too and because I know this is all me 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 but we decide I might as well talk about what I do and if it can influence a little bit of your behavior then a good thing um and, and it's not for everybody I'm not saying that you can all or should do it but I do encourage you to at least explore the idea but another, uh, uh, used to be listened to, uh, Judy and I would listen to tapes by Abraham Hicks, which is very metaphysical stuff. And there's a wonderful um, session on intentions, you know, the intent. And you hear when we do, when I talk about kimet, when we're doing a form or a punch, that focus point, we call kimet. It means to decide. And another word is intent, you know, the intent of that punch. It's not just a physical movement like an aerobics movement, it has intent, it has a meaning the same way as a, as a block would have. It's meant for a specific purpose, not just to look pretty. And the intent you put in that will read when you perform your forms or your kata. Well, you can also do a mental intention. And what, what I do with that is if I'm, and I do this for everything, whether I've got an acting job, if I've got to train some actors, if I've got to do a seminar, I will do, I will sit down and get into an alpha state and I'll put a verbal intention out, which could be as simply as put as, I am going to go into this seminar with energy. I'm gonna have speed and power. The information is gonna to flow to the forefront of my brain. I'm gonna be very clear and concise and I'm gonna love having done the seminar and people that attend are gonna love the fact that they actually intended. What does this do? The reason that, that Abraham Hicks would give in intentions is if, if you don't, if I go into a seminar without an intention, I'm more or less leaving it up to the universe to basically give me a result, which is a crapshoot. It could be a crap seminar, it could be a great one. By putting the intention out there, you're actually giving a game plan to the universe as to the exact result you want from whatever that activity is. And again, think about a grading and you're about, I'll keep using, let's use lull before the storm. If you took a few moments to just mentally go through that, that form in your head perfectly with balance, with speed, with grace, first of all, your nervous system provides you a mentally pictured as real as possible. You form a perfect mental blueprint then physically you are going to step into that particular mental representation. And hopefully it's going to become, it's going to come out as perfectly as you rehearsed it mentally. 
the next thing I would do is just put an intention, just simple, actual, loud. I always speak it out loud. I'm going to walk out and I'm going to, I'm going to have, or I'm going to have intention. I'm going to have energy. My speed is going to be there. My power, my stances are going to be connected, blah, 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 whatever it is. So again, rather than just leaving it to, again, a spin of the rule at will, I'm putting a positive plan out there to the universe. I'm sending energy toward it. And hopefully that will be what we will be represented in the physical representation of what I imagine in my mind. So again, this is this is all stuff that, that I do. It all gets down to what I keep saying, guys, be your own instructor. Just don't wait to be hand fed. Yes, you can go to a class. Yes, you can ask questions and everything and you can get knowledge. But if you go and do a seminar with me, I'm probably going to teach you what I like and what I do best, which might be quite removed from something that you would actually perform and do a lot better than I would. In other words, you know, be your own instructor, find what your passion is, whether it's in the arts, it might be within Zendo Kai, you have a chance to do a screamer or Kali, or you can practice Katana, you know, the sword work, or you can do Muay Thai, or you can do Krav Maga, Find whatever your passion is and just, just do it for the pure beauty, pure beauty and joy of performing that. Not, well, can I beat 10 other people? Can I go outside? Can I do a demonstration and people are going to think I'm amazing? Just sometimes do it for you. Remember, the battle is between you. It's, it's with yourself. And also remember to, to, to not restrict yourself to just the physical. You know, I have a book called uh, Zen and Japanese Culture by D.T. Suzuki. I've had this book since I was a teenager, and it's my Bible within the martial arts because it's, it's obviously Zen based, and it's all about where the mind of the samurai was, you know, and, and that fascinated me too, because they talk about the samurai not just being versed in sword, but they, they knew about the tea ceremony and poetry, haiku, four syllable poetry. In other words, they were all rounded gentlemen that had an understanding of art as well as the martial. And that balance is also what I encourage you to do. Often it has to be done in your own time because most of our classes are the physical aspect of what we do and they don't necessarily, uh, you know, jump into the whole mental aspect. And I think you will get so much joy out of something like Zen and Japanese culture or similar books that give you a balance of the martial. And again, it's important you understand that balance. If, you know, it's Benny Okita's, and I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again, it's a great analogy where he says, if all we're doing is learning warlike techniques of a back fist that can break somebody's nose, of a kick that then, you know, deflate somebody's diaphragm or whatever it is, or, or a choke that can put somebody to sleep or even kill them or Krav Maga that's going to take eyes out. If that's all we focus on, the analogy uses, he said, in that case, it's like I'm giving you bits of plastic and bits of metal, and I'm basically teaching you how to make a handgun. And eventually I'm teaching you how to put bullets in that handgun. At that stage, he says, you're a very dangerous person without the balance of the honor and integrity of the Bushido code and the ability to understand the artistic side of what we do that is not always akin with the actual combatives, you know, you're, you're putting a very dangerous person out there on the street. So don't just think about that with your student, think about that with yourself. I mean, I, I, if I look back at all the people I've taught over 60 years, I would imagine 10% probably have ever really got into a bad street fight, which would then presuppose that if all the focus was with all those 60 years of teaching was just on warlike or combative techniques, then what a waste of time for 90% of those people. In other words, if we don't do things that enhance the character building, the moral fiber, the integrity, the sense of honor, in ourselves, you know, of course, as much as I assume, but in ourselves, then I think uh, we've, we've really got to sort of question what we are and why we are or why we call ourselves martial artists. Remember, we don't just say we're martials, we're martial artists and there needs to be that balance. 
once again, the perfect time for you to get that balance is not in the class where the instructor is dictating what you do, but when you're at home, when you're by yourself, whether it's YouTube, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's books, you know, I've got a library full of books I keep referring to on different aspects of martial arts. That becomes, again, my individual, my personal time, my pleasure, my time to enhance what I do as a martial artist. Again, the byproduct of that is that we also get to take some of that knowledge and pass it on to our students and our peers within the arts that we love so much. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, I'm all over the place with that, but, but the final thing I want you to do also, which I do, I know it's kind of a little strange, but if I have a cold shower at the time, I hate it. Or if I do four or five rounds of Wim Hof, um, where I'm trying to do a breath retention, you know, which by the way, can be quite hard. It's not supposed to be, but after your 30 breaths in and you breathe out, you're supposed to try and hold your breath for as long as you can. I actually did uh, a breath retention of 10 and a half minutes a few weeks ago, meaning I didn't breathe for 10 and a half minutes. And talk about a mental trip. I think I died three times, but it's about continually just getting into yourself, relaxing yourself, trying to slow your heartbeat down, you know? And it has an amazing effect, by the way. It's not just mental. It has an amazing effect on your immune system because you're putting positive stresses on your body. It, in, it basically brings out fight or flight and you're learning to become more relaxed under stress. And the stresses through Wim Hof are transferable to other stresses in your life. Again, that's for a whole other conversation. So what's my point? All that stuff, breath work, you know, doing visualization, um, Abraham Hickson's intention, cold showers, all of that stuff is stuff that you don't need anything else for anyone else for. And the knowledge about how to do it is out there Boy, what an amazing journey it is, you know, and uh, I'm just encouraging, be your own instructor, just get off your butts and uh, get out there and be a doer, not a, well, I can, but I don't, you know, I, you know, I've said in, I do a Zoom class on, again on three battles and I often say, how many of you actually practice this form at least once a day since the last time we talk? And I don't ask for hands up because I know it's probably about 5% at most. So again, ask yourself, how do you expect then the next time you get in the floor to actually have an improved version of three battles if you've done it once a month or once every three months or whatever it else. So again, it takes work, it takes application, but that's what you are if you want to call yourself a full-time martial artist and po as opposed to a part-timer, as a lot of people are. And by the way, that's totally fine. People have jobs, have family and everything. I absolutely understand that people aren't full-time martial artists for all of their lives. But for those who want to consider themselves that, the world is your oyster. There is so much wonderful, wonderful, enriching knowledge out there that can make you a great martial artist. It can make you healthier and a better person, especially into your older years. And some of this mental stuff, by the way, the other thing I like to say is age alone will dictate that you do things differently. I can't do things at 71 that I used to do when I was 30 year old, but I know the things I can still do and I refuse to use as a crutch what I can't do with my bad shot or whatever. I look at what I can do and that's what I'm always going to drive and I'm gonna keep doing the best I can based on what I can do. So lastly, when you do anything and when I brought up cold showers was give yourself a pat on the back. I mean, this might sound weird if I do something that I didn't want to do, like go and lift weights. But I did a leg workout the other day and I'm still sore from doing a ridiculous leg workout because it's too hard, but I will literally go, good job, Norts, you did it. You know, I'm proud of you. It's a bit like what having you, an instructor that says, good job, you know, Kyle, or good job, you did really well today. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you just giving yourself on a pat, of, a pat on the back for work, work done for an effort put in, whether it's a cold shower, sometimes I don't want to do it, I'll get out and say, good on you. you, you did really well. That's also, I think, very, very good for your overall sort of mental health and everything. So, and that's it, never accept mediocrity. And again, we're human, I keep saying, we have days, I have days where I don't want to do anything. And there will be days where I won't do anything, but it won't last for long because I'd never want to know what it feels like to actually sit on the couch for eight hours a day watching television, just think about what I should be doing. 
So there you go. Um, any questions <laughs> after all of that? Lots, JP. Lots. Um, uh, Adam from Queensland has a question relating to Japanese culture. Go, Adam. G'day, Soko. Thanks so much for um, uh, giving up your time for us today. I really appreciate it. Um, one of the things I've been um, reading into, I, I'm a massive fan of Japanese culture and um, looking for ways to um, use that to improve my life and my, my martial arts training. I'm just wondering if you've come across a, a term called ikigai, um, which is, um, if I hold up my little book here, I don't know if you can see that. Uh-huh, yep. Uh, put it up again. Oh, hold on. It went on to the little screen. Start talking again and I'll bring it back to the big screen. Here it is here. It's by a, a bloke named Ken Mogi. Okay, um, yep. It, it's just got these basic pillars about starting small, releasing yourself, um, harmony and sustainability, the joy of little things and being in the here and now. So they're pretty basic things, but um, just reading this, I found it fascinating how I can relate that to my, my training and um, yeah, just give it a bit more depth and breadth like you like you're saying, and just wondering if you'd you'd come across any of that kind of stuff before. No, I, I know I know a bit of it, you know, and what what you're talking about being in a moment is huge. You know, I, I always say there's nothing more in the moment producing than say martial arts, you know. And and by the way, that's that's you know, when I was talking about the um that you get to the stage of shuhari. The restage is where you become, you, you no longer are using conscious thought, you are just doing. In Japanese, they have a word called myo, M-Y-O, with a little asterisk over it. It's again, I don't want to get in a long-winded um, definition or explanation of that, but it basically just means you are just doing where you've gone through the mental stage. It's a bit like, um, I'll tell you a good example, which I saw of Mio, and I've said this on podcast before, of a harp player that was with Linda Ronstead when she was out on tour with the Mexican love songs. You know, and they were songs that have learned from her father who was Mexican heritage. Anyway, one of the two, one of the band members was one of the last two living members of the Mexican harp. And I always like to say, these guys talk about rebel rousers. I mean, they chased everything that stood still long enough and had a skirt on. They would drink like no tomorrow, which was very much for me a contrast in what I used to see when they would play their instruments. And anyway, I, you know, this particular gentleman, Pepe, I always laugh Mexican and called Pepe. That's funny, right? But he, he had the Mexican harp and I asked him once, I said, would, you know, Pepe, would just play something for me with the harp? And he was like, no, no, that's, a, you know, I don't want to do it. Anyway, I talked him into it. And again, it was still something that I've never forgotten to this day as an example, probably of what you're talking about and what Muir is. Because this guy suddenly sat down with a harp and he had a little smile on his face. And it was like he just watched something. It's like this was being channeled through him and he watched his fingers just playing this instrument you know, with obviously the most beautiful notes you can ever imagine, but he was no longer conscious of it. He was just doing, which is what Muir is. It was totally in the moment. And all the knowledge that he had had, I imagine, of chords, of learning notes, of learning how to hit strings, became so much just in, it was just him. It was no longer conscious thought. It was just doing. And we do that with martial arts. Eventually, like when we go through three battles, as you know, I talk about elbows in, inside line of the hand, outside line of the shoulder, chin back, shoulders down, all into the heart, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole lot of physical things that you need to do that take very much frontal lobe concentration. But the idea of doing it over and over and over is no different from driving a car when you, you're fiddling to find the indicator and how hard to push the brake and keep the car on the road. Eventually you could be, you know, texting, which people do while they're driving and everything becomes automatic. That's almost becoming in a new state of mind. And that's, that's what we do. Eventually we want to get to with our art where we're so in the moment, there's no conscious thought and we're just expressing our art in the most spontaneous way possible. In Japanese culture, they talk about the swordsman when he's holding the sword, 
if you if the surgeon was looking at a poem and thinking, oh, he's about to strike me here and then I'm going to block and I'm going to do this, what it does is form a suke. It's like a stoppage of the mind where your thoughts no longer flow and you've basically formed a dam. It's like running water and putting a dam up. At that stage, there's, a, there's an opening for your opponent to strike you down. And this, this flow, this in the moment sort of mind state is what we ultimately want with martial arts. And I'm sure that's what, what you're sort of referring to. And it's, it's fascinating if you can be in a moment. I used to get guys, and Kyle probably knows when I do my speed routine with uh, reality-based training, I'll get somebody else and give them a bit of a speed strike to the head, slap them inside the face and their eyes uh, go like this. I say, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to do it again. Try and block it. I love to say to them, I bet you're not thinking about next week's rent right now. <laughs> in other words, they're totally in that moment. Our arts can do that. And how healthy is that? Because we're always, you know, Eckhart Tolle is another gentleman we listen to who talks about whatever happened in the past, whatever's going to happen in the future is just a story. What happened in the past is a story. The only thing that's real is this moment right now where if you can learn to be in the moment and be actually aware of being aware, that's an incredibly healthy state to be rather than thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, what you're going to do next week. You know, just engross yourself in what is happening right now. Again, with training, it can be exactly that, to be so in the moment with whatever technique you're doing that it becomes a, a, an in-the-moment expression of this senor, you know, which is very zen-like because we're always in our heads. We, we never get out of our heads. I used to say that people can walk down a beautiful beach <coughs> at sunset and have the most beautiful red sun and sunset that is just glorious and often be oblivious to it because all they're thinking about is the problem that they have, what their wife did, what their kids are doing, what they're going to do tomorrow. And they miss something that's so glorious and free and right there for you to just basically absorb into your whole soul and your whole being, you know, and, and unfortunately a lot of us miss that. So being in the moment is, is an incredibly important thing for people to sort of look into. Any other questions? Um, so, okay, I've got a question. We've, we've spoken or you've spoken for the last um, nearly an hour about how you do this. Now, this has obviously been acquired over years of training is it is it a thought process like your thought process has always been to learn even like you know i think we we're on the phone to each other wednesday when you drive into lucky giles to do more training when did you has this been a process that has been instilled in you like by your coaches and what do you think is the process that maybe stops people like they might be this way for a certain period but then maybe as the years go on they lose this drive? Is it, is it comparison? Is it an element of fear? What, what do you think may, may stop people from not thinking this way as much as they should? I think, Kyla, can be, a, a, even what you mentioned then, it could be a number of things that do that. You know, I would hesitate to say that maybe, maybe it's just not your passion. You know, I believe if, if you know, I, I think I mentioned on another podcast, I watched a, um, a documentary on Keith Richards, which you've heard me say, and Keith's nearly, you know, with the Rolling Stones guitarist, he's nearly 80. And what struck me again as an 80 year old was the incredible passion he still had for what he's done for his whole life. And that's play the guitar, write music and be a musician. And the fact that he was just, all he was thinking about is what he's going to compose next, how to be a better guitarist, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, that was his passion. I believe my passion is martial arts. I, I honestly know when I first saw Tina Seberano demonstrate his karate that that's what I want to do with my life, you know? And I was lucky enough to just keep that through line and make everything else fit in with that as opposed to building a like of work and stress and everything else and then trying to fit my martial arts into that paradigm. Now, is that possible to everybody? No, I'm not even, I'm not even suggesting that. But if, if you can find your passion, I believe it's not that difficult to do what I'm doing. Fear is a big thing. And you brought up comparisons. I really encourage, you know, we always say the battle is within. It's the battle within yourself. 
because if you compare yourself, you're going to be better than some, which gives you an ego. You're going to be worse than some, which might make you feel a little bit like shit and feel unworthy. It's really just about self-improvement. You know, it's about you just being better than you. When I used to do gradings way back, you know, I always said that I didn't, I never graded people on their ability. I graded them on their ability to try. Meaning if that individual, I believe had given 100% and was showing 100% of their individual capability based on size, by physical limitations or whatever, then that was worthy of reward as in rank, as opposed to a naturally gifted athlete who trains once a week and can still do everything as though they've been training seven days a week. I would tend to hold that person back, you know? So it's, it's such an individual and fear comes from comparison, like going to a grading, oh, I'm going to look like an idiot. Gee, what if I mess up? What if I don't get through? What are my friends going to think? You know, it's very debilitating fear, but again, you've got to just do it for you. This is why I'm saying do something just because you get joy out of it. Get up there and just have fun, you know? And if you get up and do a grading, it's not the be all and end all. It doesn't change who you are. Use it always as a positive thing that if you don't go through, it's a great gift that somebody says, look, I believe with a bit more work, you can be that much better. And I think that's that, you know, is always a good driver and everything. But but I, I get fear. I get it. I get it. You know, if I go and teach, say, Overseas, you know, I've done seminars at Chuck Norris's UFAF convention, you know, with 250 black belts on the floor. And of course I feel fear. You know, I go, oh my God, they're going to see if Norton slowed down a little bit, or am I going to be up to scratch? Are they going to think the techniques won't? Whatever it might be, I go through all of that, but I will put out an intention. And I've always said fear, by the way, is the friend, you know, I've used Customato. Tyson's trainer was the one that said, whether it was his original saying, he said, fear is the friend of extraordinary people. Everybody feels fear in some way, shape or form, if they're willing to be honest, admit it. It's what you do about it. You know, and I find that fear of not being up to scratch just makes me work that much harder to allay those fears to be okay, you know. And once you've done as much as you can and you're comfortable with that, that is all you can do. Be comfortable with that. Be okay with that. As long as you are giving your all, you should pat yourself on the back. And that, for me, is worthy of any amount of reward, you know. Um, but as I, that's why I'm saying, you know, what I do with my life and everything, I'm not saying everybody can replicate that. And why should they? You know, everybody has an individual journey. But... I'm just encouraging people to just take the most of every waking moment, you know? Now that might mean doing bugger all, you know? Sometimes, you know, to sit on the couch with Judy and watch Heartland on Netflix, which we're binge watching, is so incredibly joyful for me because I'm not thinking about martial arts, I'm not thinking about movies, I'm not thinking about my next job. It's almost an in, in the moment sense of enjoyment and, and I'm not going to give myself a hard time about that anymore. That is okay. That's the yin and yang. That's the balance of what we do. The flip side is it's not going to be all I do. I'm going to balance it with some hard work in the gym. I'm going to go and see Lockie. I'm going to get on the BJJ mats and I'm going to hit the bag. In other words, it's all about it. That's what I choose to do. But uh, again, Carl, we could go on and on. But I think, you know, fear is, is something like that. Just, just, just do it for you, you know find your passion, express yourself, but be like Benny. Benny Okita is, again, I use Benny all the time with his quotes. He's, he, I remember him saying when he used to, when he was competing and fighting, he said, I never ever got in the ring without having done my homework. I never got in the ring wondering, can I last 10 rounds? Can I punch hard enough? Can I hit hard enough? Because he always did his homework. He said the rest was then basically up to whatever it was. He said, if I got beaten, it would purely because the other person was better than me, not because I wasn't prepared. Hence Napoleon saying that confidence is a factor of preparation. The more prepared you are for combat, and he was referring to the battlefield, the more, you know, better mindset and the more you, uh, chance you have in actual combat. It was the same whether you're going for grading, if you're going to a class, if you're going to Whatever it is, the more prepared you are, the more you have done to prepare yourself, the more confident you will be to at least be a representation of the best of yourself, you know? 
so there. <laughs> it's good. And I mean, I think that's, um, that is something that we do wrestle with. And I know I wrestle with, you know, it's, uh, it is a, a fear you, you walk in and like you, you are one that has put a white belt on on more than one occasion, both mentally and physically. So it's, it's just constantly being given yourself that permission to fail. And we spoke about vulnerability yesterday as well. Same thing. Yeah. And, and, and I think you remember, I, I used Chuck Norris, you know, everyone knows Chuck's a very close friend of mine, but I still use an example. And Chuck Norris, when, you know, I was the one that introduced Brazilian, the Machado's to him, brought him around to the house, even though he had gone to Brazil, that's another story. But I still remember when we set up the first school for the Machado's in the Valley in Los Angeles, that was Bob Wall, Chuck and myself, that one of the first persons on the mat was Chuck Norris wearing a white belt. And Chuck was already a legend over there at the time in karate and movies. And I said, oh man, how, how great an example of that. He didn't care that people were gonna go, oh, well, I thought Chuck Norris knew every art, you know, <laughs> opened a man. He put on a white belt because all he wanted to do was learn something new. And in fact, Chuck, when I trained with Chuck, we would actively try and find interesting people. We brought George Dillman, you know, who's the pressure point specialist. We brought him to the house to sort of show what he did. We found a guy in downtown Los Angeles that taught Tai Chi that was supposedly had Chi that he could drive a person six feet away and put him on their back. We found him, by the way, we went down and found him in a, he's working in a soup kitchen down in downtown LA. And I wanted to sort of have that, that experience. And the funny part was he finally said, oh, look, you'd have to be an actual student of mine for it to work. And I went, okay, that's no surprises there. The point being that someone like Chuck was willing to be a white belt, then shit, anybody can. It is okay to be honest about what you don't know, because if you don't empty your cup, as they would say, how are you going to taste somebody else's tea? Um, you've got to stop emptying cup and being okay with not having any knowledge or not professing to have any in order to taste somebody else's tea and become a better person at whatever it is you're delving into. Alex Kostic was great with that, you know. Alex used to do stuff that did my head in because they don't focus punches like we do with um, Sistema, it's a whole different application. And yet when I held the pads for Alex or he would make contact, I went, well, there's no question that is ridiculously powerful and hard, you know? So it was just a different expression. And, you know, I, I just talk a lot of, I said to Alex, I don't have time to learn a new art, Alex, but I just need some principles that'll help me do what I already do that little bit better, you know? But again, I had no clue about Sistema, you know, but, you know, Matt would do it. We'd all just jump in. Billy Monet would do it. We're all on the floor. We're just students under, uh, you know, Alex Kostic. How good is that? And I tell you what, it's very freeing being a student because you don't have to have all the answers anymore. <laughs> you know, you can wait and have somebody tell you what to do. And I enjoy that. And again, never, ever forget that you're students for life. You know, Buckminster Fuller, who wrote a book called The Critical Path, he was the one that said about goal setting, anything that stops still long enough is probably dead, whether it's a leaf, a plant, an animal, stop so long it's probably dead. The reason that you set a goal and becomes not nearly as rewarding as you thought is to make you set a new goal, to keep you moving, to keep you advancing, you know, hence, hence the journey of our life in the martial arts. There's a, um, I have a photo of you, Richard, it was um, at the last time I think we did Alex, I think it was February 2020. Um, I took a photo of when Alex was calling you up to partner up with him when he was demonstrating techniques. And I think that's that's a photo that I really like. like I, I will look back on it from time to time because I go, there's a guy who's still willing to be a student. And I guess you could say just that photo backs up everything you've said for the last hour. If you did that willingly, you were mucking around with Billy. It was hilarious. That you were just giving each other shit, trying, trying new things, making fun of each other. It was just really refreshing to see two people that have been in martial arts for over 50 years each still behaving like that. Yeah, we, we just actively try and be, be role models in that sense. You know, it's funny when, when I wanted, I wanted Alex to basically demonstrate on me. Alex actually said, oh, no, I can't do that out of respect. And I said, Alex, you have to. I need to feel it. 
if, if you want to make me a believer in, in, in stammer and what you do, I need to feel it, you know? So that's the other thing. I don't want to be sitting back as an armchair expert. What better than to be out there and to have someone like Alex actually crack you with one of his strikes. There's nothing better to, to make, again, what I said, make you a believer where you go. And I said, well, there's no question. I felt that, you know, you just got to be actively part of it. It's okay, as I said, you know, Benny, Benny always, I always, every time we do a Benny Okita seminar, you know, he said so many times he will go into a school and the instructor or the master that invites him in sits on a chair on the side and watches the class with all the students. Why? Because they're scared shitless that they're going to found out for actually not knowing something. Well, what sort of an example is that for the students, you know, anyway, you know, and Benny would always make a big point. If an instructor that ran the school invited him, he was out there lined up like everybody else, he would point that out, which I think was a really healthy thing to do because you can't know anything. There's so much I don't know. And I love the fact that I don't know it. Why do you think it excites me to go to Lockie Giles? It's because like it's learning a whole new art. And I'm excited by that. I'm not depressed to think, well, I'm supposed to know all this and I don't, because now I have something that makes me want to get up every day and work on something completely new that helps me be as much of an all-rounded martial artist as I can be. And again, be comfortable with where you're at. Like Billy and I were talking about certain forms. Carter, he says, I can't kick high anymore, you know? And I can't, I probably could, but I don't. That's okay, then kick to the waist or kick to the leg. Do whatever it is you can do, but don't because you can no longer kick the height you used to. Stop kicking at all, you know, except where you're at. And it is absolutely okay. We're all fallible. We're all human. We're all on the journey. Just keep doing. Just keep doing. That's, um, that's it in a nutshell. That's it in a nutshell. Does anyone um, have any last questions they would like to ask before we let Soke get on with his Saturday afternoon? He's probably got a few more episodes of Heartland to watch. By the way, did everyone see that I'm, I want to be like Kyle when I grow up? It's still, it's still only whiskers. But I tell you what, Kyle, it takes forever to paint this grey in every morning. That's oh, you know, shut up. Like, yeah, <laughs> bloody hard, you know? Anyway. <laughs> As I said, you I can't decide which one of the three musketeers you look like the most. <laughs> um, Any questions from anybody? I don't have a, I don't have a question. I just want to say, so okay, thank you so much for spending your time this afternoon. Um, so much in all of that, um, I think to to inspire all of us. So thank you so much for for the time today and um, sharing all of that. Um, I see it's recorded because I think every martial arts student needs to um, to watch it and there's plenty of things to take away. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate that very much. Look, it's just, you know, I, you know, I can go on for hours as Kyle knows, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's fun. I love, as I, you've heard me quote Benny so many times, you know, I just love sitting down and just having conversation with people I respect because I always come away with something new to think about. And I think that's gold. So you don't have to agree with anything I say, by the way, everybody just, just listen to it. But there's one little something that just tweaks your imagination and gets you to be a little more of a doer or explore in a different area Then job done, you know? So thank you, Don. I appreciate that. That, that. You know. Guys, any, um, sorry, anyone got any other last questions? No. Okay. Well, cool. well, Simon, come on. They're worried that I'll go on for another hour. Huh? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stay. Um, guys, I just want to thank everybody for chiming in and joining this discussion. Um, I do appreciate not just only Soke's time, but all your time. Um, I know at the moment we've got two of our major states involved in Zendo Kai in a, in a lockdown state. And God knows how long New South Wales is going to be there. So all this stuff, um, if we, uh, as Queensland, go into um, anything further, there'll be more Zooms made available on the CMA private members page. And we've got our trivia night tonight, which is open to everybody. Um, but in this case, I really want to thank Soke Richard's um, time. I want to thank um, Judy for allowing him on a Saturday. 
You mm. saying I'm not in charge here, Carl? Yes, I am. No way, no, um, you're in. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you say to me, your your wife is always one degree higher than you. Isn't that the case? I like you know, such a thing as an eleventh Dan. <laughs> Judy's very sensitive with me. I I pulled a calf muscle a little while ago. I was doing some sprints over in the park, and I came back and I said, "God, I pulled this muscle. Why the hell did that happen?" She says, "Cause you're an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> She says you're not 40 anymore. I said, "Thank you, sweetie. That's that's good. That's exactly the input I needed." Uh, keeps it real it but hey before i go look thank you for everybody that joined in it says a lot about you that you'll spend your time and just join in on a conversation so i, I appreciate your time as well as i said i hope you get something out of it even if it's a tiny little bit but but well done for giving your time up as well as i said it's in indicative that you you're interested in in furthering yourselves and your your martial arts and um yeah, good stuff. So thank you. And thanks, Kyle, for arranging this. Even though you are green belt, but you're on mute, Kyle. Uh, oh, oh you've been promoted. Day. You've been promoted back up to green belt, Kyle. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it goes up and down. It goes up and down. Guys, um, we'll call it up there. Look, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for your time. Thank you, Soto. Um, I'll stop recording this now, but it'll be a useful clip soon. <laughs>